A bomb blast at a political rally in Pakistan over the weekend has left at least 39 people dead. Police say it occurred in the Bajawar district, which borders Afghanistan. Now, to chat about this tragedy in more detail is our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, who joins us once again from Los Angeles. Lisa, government officials say the explosion was from a suspected suicide bomber on the outskirts of the city of Carr. What more can you tell us? Yeah, so far, it's a, I think the death toll is, is peaking 40 and 120 plus have been injured. Uh, look, this happens all too often uh, in Pakistan, neighboring Afghanistan, insurgencies embedded within civilian populations. And that's really the major tragedy here is that they aim to kill civilians. They aim, I mean, that's what a suicide bomber is known for, right? To uh, mix into the main population, whether, you know, you see uh, suicide bombers in Israel, throughout the Middle East. I mean, we've, we've had histories of, of suicide bombers who are willing to take their own lives, indoctrinated to the point, radicalized to the point where they take their own lives because they believe they'll be martyrs on the other end. Uh, and of course, 40 innocent people, civilians uh, murdered, um, uh, in the meantime. And, uh, you know, again, this is something that we've talked about for decades now is, uh, you know, giving aid to Pakistan from the United States, for example, but not using that as leverage to say, get rid of your terrorism, start, stop harboring terrorists, clear out your terrorists, uh, you know, do more to eradicate terrorism from within your borders. And um, I think that's really the, the main point here is that there's always innocent people in harm's way, children, young people, uh, uh, and innocent people who were just going about their business. You know, with more and more violence erupting in Haiti these days, a number of countries, including the United States, urging their citizens to leave the island as quickly as possible. Yeah, you know, when we get these kinds of warnings, it's interesting because you know, nobody's paying attention until you get the warning. You're like, oh, wait, things must be really bad there that they want to evacuate all Western um, civilian uh, citizens. Um, so that's exactly what's going on in Haiti. We've known that they have had this chaos um, brewing there for a very, very long time. And now it's gotten to the point where they have not been able to get it under control. So they're asking anyone from the United States who works, lives there to, to evacuate immediately. Now, you and I chatted a bit about this before, how the United States has been supporting Ukraine in its war with Russia. Well, Lisa, news just came out that the U.S. unveiled a Taiwan weapons aid package worth up to $345 million. I guess there was some money left over for Taiwan. It's yeah. a move that will likely anger China, even as the Biden administration declined to provide more details on the arms in the package. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. We knew this was going to happen, but we didn't know how quickly. And we didn't know if the Biden administration was looking to escalate things right now. But let me put out a few things here. Uh, yes, it was a $345 million uh, military aid package. Uh, yes, it looks very, very... Um, uh, it looks like the United States wants to take a clear position on this while at the same time, like you said, angering um, and perhaps escalating the situation with China. And also, um, you have to also question the timing of all of this. Is this too, is this a distraction from what's going on in, in the Biden White House with his son Hunter? Is this something that they, do they want to get into another war? Are they looking to escalate things? You know, um, you look at Ukraine, are they trying to kind of distract us from what's going on in Ukraine? That war just going on and on and on, something you thought would be very, very quick, uh, lasting for a very long time. We're putting millions more into that. We just okayed an $800 million package to Ukraine again uh, here in the United States, giving them all kinds of, of weapons and cluster bombs, as you and I spoke about in, in, in recent weeks. And we know that they're using them not only in Ukraine, but also in Russia itself, which they promised they wouldn't. That's the latest. Um, now, with Taiwan, you question the timing of all this. Obviously, the United States is strapped. It's not something that they had, you know, they, they, they had extra, but it's not something that they had a, a, a surplus of. Uh, so obviously, scrapping together whatever they did have in the meantime, we were told that they would wait until there were more weapons manufactured to give a package to Taiwan, but it happened more quickly. And that's why I say are we to judge or question the timing of all of this? Meanwhile, China and North Korea reaffirmed military ties at a recent meeting in Pyongyang, and North Korea wants to annihilate the United States within this century. They're vowing to do so, Lisa. 
Of course, you have two communist peas in a pod uh, reaffirming their relationship with one another. Um, you know, it makes perfect sense. We've seen in the past few years that the uh, enemies of the West are getting together and in ways that are quite meaningful, both to them and, and a warning to us here in the West. So uh, China and North Korea, North Korea was kind of dormant for a long time, but now they have reaffirmed their relationship with China. But not only that, but are flexing their muscles towards the United States and, as you said, threatening to take the United States off the map. So these are big words coming from our enemies. Uh, and um, it's it's more of a wake-up call that they are are, are banding, to, banding together because that it, together they do have some sort of, of power, whether it's evading sanctions, uh, military trades, uh, economic, uh, you know, leveraging with one another, uh, that that's the wake-up call. Thousands of people took to the streets in Gaza on Sunday, protesting poor living conditions and chronic power outages. It was a public show of discontent with the territory's Hamas government. Hamas security forces, Lisa, quickly clamped down on the protesters. Yes, so this is something that you don't hear too often in the mainstream media. So I thank you, Hal, for bringing attention to this story. You only hear about when Palestinians complain about Israel because it smears Israel. Uh, but you don't hear about Palestinians complaining about their own leadership, and that is Hamas in, in Gaza. You also hear about them complaining about the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank and other areas. But mainly uh, Hamas, a terror organization that is recognized by the United States and many Western countries as a terror organization is leading the people. And what do they do? They take the money and they put it into weapons. They hide those weapons in schools. They they indoctrinate and radicalize young children, as young as three, to say death to Jews. And they raise them this way. And uh, this is the control that they have on the people. And the people are tired of it. They don't have proper means. They don't have uh, electricity and food and all the, the things that they could have if they had proper leadership. And that's exactly why they're out on the streets. And of course, the Palestinians want to hush this up very quickly because it goes against their narrative. Their narrative is that Israel is the oppressor. Their narrative is that Israel is an apartheid state. Their narrative is that Israel is occupying. And this narrative doesn't really match that. They're saying that it's youth, our leadership, Hamas, uh, that is the problem and not Israel. So um, it's an important story to follow. Now, in response to a recent string of public Quran demonstrations by anti-Islam activists in Denmark, Lisa, that country is now seeking to legally prevent the burnings of the Quran and other religious holy books. Would that include the Bible? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, let's see if this even works. You think people who are crazy enough to go burn, you know, Torah or Bible or the Quran or, you know, whatever holy text in front of an embassy will now be deterred by a law? And where is that? In Denmark? <laughs> um, you know, it's a pretty peaceful place. I, I don't think they have too many outlaws there. But at the same time, this has become a big trend, a big tit for tat kind of ping pong game with the burning of texts to show outrage or uh, disgust or disdain for each other's religions. Um, it's it's very upsetting because regardless of what you believe, all three uh, major religions of the world do share some fundamental overlap. Uh, and when you burn that text, you're burning that overlap, right? So you are going against your own religion, whether you're Christian or Muslim or um, <clears throat> Jewish, you know, it, 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 it should be a holy text to you regardless and show some sort of respect for that text uh, regardless. So here we have a law. Let's see if the law helps us kind of quit this trend. Lisa, French embassy in Niger was attacked as protesters waving Russian flags march through the capital. So what's that connection between Niger and Vladimir Putin's Russia? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Imagine how disenchanted the people of Niger have to be to be out on the streets saying, we don't want to be controlled by France anymore, but we believe a better stepfather here would be Russia. And that is why you're seeing Russian flags on the streets over there with people protesting and saying they want no more French influence. They don't want to be controlled by France. They want nothing to do with France. Uh, and they prefer Russia. They think that's going to be a better future for them. Well, that's amazing. And apparently the Russian mercenary group Wagner is operating close by uh, in Mali. And Putin is allegedly expanding his influence across West Africa. So maybe there's a the bit of that connection as well. Lisa, Iranian TV actress Shora Gamer was arrested and charged after speaking out against the regime in Tehran while also wishing Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu good health last week after it was revealed that he was not well. 
Yeah, so this is interesting. You know, my first uh, reaction to the story was why is an Iranian actress even wishing BB well? I mean, not that it should be she should be arrested for it, but it just goes to show right now where the people of Iran are. They are looking to stick it to the government. They're looking to put, you know, stick a finger in the eye of the regime. And they she knew that by obviously supporting the protesters by supporting the revolution and also by showing support for Israel, showing support for Bibi Netanyahu, who is the prime minister of Israel and obviously a very strong figure who has stood up to the regime to say, we're going to retaliate against anything you do with with nuclear weapons, or if you attack us, we're going to retaliate. Obviously a very strong figure. Um, She knew exactly, I think, what she was doing, but obviously I don't think she believed it would be punishable by, you know, arrest or jail time, which we're seeing is the case. So it just, um, you know, another example of a celebrity or somebody who's in the public eye uh, being punished as a symbol of what the regime can do, telling people not to support the movement, not to support Israel, not to support the United States. And here you have an example of what happens when you do. Now, speaking of Israel, government officials there say the country will build a 100 billion shekel or about $27 billion U.S. rail expansion that will connect its outlying areas to metropolitan Tel Aviv. At least in the future, it could provide overland links to Saudi Arabia. That would be something. This is wonderful. These stories, I mean, as somebody who's been covering the region for so many years, these stories really make me so happy and they show so much progress Uh, and a coming of age in the Middle East. Let's just hope that it works. I mean, we've known that uh, Saudi Arabia will perhaps in in the near future normalize relations with Israel, fingers crossed that it does happen, adding themselves to the list of growing countries that are normalizing relations with Israel uh, under the Abraham Accords, which of course was brokered by the United States under President Trump in the the last term. Uh, And now these are deals of prosperity. So we have economic cooperation, we have military cooperation, we have private and public deals that are benefiting both sides, both Israel and these moderate Arab states. Saudi Arabia, if they join as well is going to really shift that axis in the Middle East to say these are the countries that will move forward and these are the countries that are going to stick with Iran's regime and terrorism and stay in the dark ages. And we hope that the people of Iran can even join over. So we're hoping for for that revolution as well. But this train is really symbolic not just going from north to south in the in the small country of Israel, which is wonderful, uh, but but it does have potential to go outside the country and to connect Israel with its neighboring Arab states. Lisa, let's bring things a little closer to home for just a moment. What's the latest with Trump? Does Donald Trump really stand a shot at winning the Republican nomination, especially what he's going through right now, being tied up in the courts? You know, Hal, if I had a little bit of money for every time I was asked that question, I could probably, uh, I don't know, Stop doing a little bit of work, but I wouldn't even retire. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But the point being, um, let's just let's put the facts out first, and I'll give you my opinion. The facts are that he is ahead in the polls. He is way ahead in the polls. So he's probably doubling what DeSantis is bringing in. I think this morning I heard numbers like um, uh, it was 30 to 40. 40% 40% for Trump. I don't know. Don't quote me on that. But DeSantis is at 16%. And I do, do remember that. And then the others were at 2 or 3% each. So um, obviously, Trump is leading by a lot, by a lot. I think a lot of people want him back in office. They enjoyed his policies. They enjoyed an America under his governance. And they didn't mind the questionable t- tweets that, 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 he, that a lot of people don't want him for. Um, on the other end, He's in a lot of legal trouble. Um, Every day there's something new. Uh, Whether you believe that they're contrived, whether you believe that the legal system is being used against him, or you believe that he actually is guilty um, and and should be punished, let's put that off to the side. We don't know what his future will be because of these these legal issues um, and if he'll be able to basically run for office or if he will be able to serve. So um, he is such a divisive polarizing candidate, unfortunately, um, that that, that's the issue. And you have so many Americans who are standing behind him and do appreciate him. And not just Americans, by the way, he's very popular in many parts of the world. Uh, And you see this kind of like this Trump wave or this Trump fever that spread throughout the world with a lot of different countries electing conservative candidates. And I wouldn't call Trump the face of conservative politics, but he was the outside contender that came in without being part of the problem, without being part of the swamp, as we call it, without being part of the establishment, and was able to offer changes that 
that were common sense changes. Um, and again, if you put aside your 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 if your disdain for him because of his personality or, or whatever it may be, um, he did come in as an outsider and served without without wanting any of that you know establishment kind of um, kind of a. Uh, 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 underground politics and, and that culture that, that a lot of people in Washington bring to the table. And we're seeing that right now with the Biden family. That's a great example of that. She's a political commentator and the foreign affairs expert from the Foreign Desk, Lisa Daftari. Thanks again for joining us today from Los Angeles. Thank you.